I think one really interesting idea is, is around Avenidas that Richard and I have been talking about is, is there an opportunity for these sort of focus groups? It'd be great to have, have more time for these kinds of questions. So unfortunately, with these things, we are always got so much to talk about. I'm um, excited to now ask Tuk to come up here from Omnilabs, who's going to finish it off with a very exciting demonstration uh, of him and his team. So. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tuk, and uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Omnilabs. And uh, at Omnilabs, we're making robots, uh, surprisingly, for seniors. So, uh, but uh, let me go a bit into detail very soon. So you, you all know uh, it's a very fast-growing uh, aging population, right? Uh, you know, 46 million seniors in the U.S., and there are 10,000 more every day. But do you know that actually 90% of the seniors, they want to live at home, in their own private home? You know, so this is like a huge growing trend of uh, aging in place. And well, while staying at home, you, you know, the seniors still have the need to get connected with families, with other people, right? Um, as uh, Wesley was mentioning, isolation uh, and uh, loneliness is, is actually very bad for your health. But all the technologies these days, uh, they're not quite there yet. You know, I, I'm sure all of you would have a uh, certain occasion that you struggle with the technology, whether you know, it's a computer, uh, whether it's a tablet. So it not always works. So what do we do? Basically, we're developing a robot from the ground up that designed to be very easy to set up, very easy to use, and it requires zero touch from the senior. Basically, it should just magically work in your home. And we designed it to fit into a home nicely, like a, a piece of furniture, if you will. Uh, so let me introduce you uh, to Scott uh, on the robot here. So the robot's called Omni, and uh, that Scott is driving the robot. Uh, Scott, you can say hi to people. Hello. Uh, where are you Hello. from, Scott? Where are you right now? I, I'm in San Ramon in the East Bay. There you go. So, yeah, so families or caregivers or anyone can call uh, as long as they have uh, Wi-Fi internet. So they can, call, they can call in from like 1,000 miles away. Uh, one of my favorite things to do with the robot, I actually put one in uh, my home in Vietnam. That's where I grew up. And uh, I would call in, I would drive into the kitchen, and my grandma would teach me how to cook. My favorite dish, you know, in her childhood. And it's amazing because, you know, she just continues to do, do whatever she does, you know, whether cooking, whether painting. Uh, and, you know, I just kind of rolling around and just interact with her. Nice to see you. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Yes, so there are two cameras. One, the, uh, the camera right here, we would actually see uh, the view here. And then there's one more that shows uh, the objects go on the ground so that he can avoid. And uh, the neck can move up and down. That way, you know, he can really look on, like, let's say, you know, you have, uh, you want to show, like, a photo book. Uh, or your pills, or you know your uh, dinner. All right. Uh, let me just kind of place to the presentation here. Yeah. So here's some of the use cases, right? So you can you know continue to paint, uh, and then the robot can uh, with your family you can just drive around and look at your painting, uh, or you can read your favorite uh, bedtime story uh, to your grandchildren. Uh, or cooking together. Uh, that's, as I say, that's something that I really enjoy doing with my grandma. Uh, or sharing a meal. You know, because it's so easy to use, so easy to, uh, to uh, just stay on the, the, uh, you know, the, the other side, basically I just need a computer um, uh, to drive a robot. And so, you know, sometimes I would just, uh, you know, sit at the, with my grandma or my parents uh, sharing the meal together. So, so far we're running pilot program and we have really uh, interesting engagement metrics. Uh, people use it for more than 30 minutes per session and 80% of the uh, user would just switch to use our robot as the main communication way uh, because it's just so natural, so comfortable to use. And we also save uh, one life already. Uh, and the, the, the real user uh, is shown in the picture here. Uh, I'll, I can tell you more details of the story uh, later, you know, if you can't find me. 
uh, but she uh, lived down in San Diego. Uh, we got a lot of good press, uh, New York Times, CNBC, uh, SF Chronicles, uh, for our work. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, you know, seniors are very open to the idea. You know, in the beginning, it sounds weird, right? It sounds, you know, too, uh, too strange. But the moment that the family show up on the screen, interacting with the seniors, uh, everyone loves it. You know, it just uh, becomes like, kind of like an embodiment of a family uh, and become a part of their life very naturally. So right now we are uh, preparing for a launch. We're going to launch very soon in April. Uh, and uh, if you go sign up on our website, uh, we'll give out like a $500 discount uh, for the robot for the uh, pre-launch pre sale. Uh, but uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's always nice to have uh, robots walking around. Uh, we are almost out of time. I'm just going to ask everybody out for just a couple of minutes, um, and you know, feel free if you're interested in any of these companies, come up, take their email, give them your email, and have a quick chat. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, all five of you, including your friend. Uh, I, I think the first, the first question for me, but then opening up to you on this is Wesley, uh, Wesley and Tuck. You know, different. Different, different approaches to social isolation are here, um, both interesting you know, perspectives. Just a quick show of hands. If you had to have like a million dollars, you're venture capitalists, and you're going to give uh, either a million dollars to Wesley with his social isolation, more of a sort of the speaking picture frame model, or there's uh, Tuck, uh, well, uh, Tuck and Team with the, uh, with the roving, roving robot model. Uh, who votes, sorry, this is going to be harsh, but you know, venture capital is always harsh. So Wesley and Televisit, who votes to give them the million dollars? Okay, Televisit, this is Wesley, the first one with the talking picture frame. Remember that? Okay. How many we got that? Okay. One more time, one more time. Perfect. Okay. If there are any venture capitalists with million dollars, by the way, these guys would like to know about it. And then uh, who here is giving a million dollars to Tuck and his walking robot? Wow, looks like Tuck is walking away with the robot. Fantastic, good job. Uh, okay, well, any uh, other quick questions for anybody here uh, while we have um, them up on stage? Very exciting. Yeah, in the back, sir. Yeah, 1,500, 1,500. So that's including the discount. So, oh, oh you're buying one already? See, we have a buyer, I think. Yes. <laughs> yes, and if you refer people, you get further discount too. Oh, okay. I, any non-robot related questions just so that we get these other three? Is, it, or is yours for Tuck or somebody else? In the robot. Oh, okay. It's yeah. a robot question. Uh, in the robot, is the technology for the video similar to Skype or Facebook? Excellent. Uh, we, I know we're out of time, and Richard's about to rugby tackle us off. So just please welcome, big, big, big round of applause for our awesome entrepreneurs. Thank you all. Good job. Good job. So you guys have been very good. There's one more session to go, which I do definitely think you're going to enjoy. Um, there's lemonade and cookies out, just outside. So I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. Grab some lemonade and a cookie, but come back in. We're going to start in five minutes, so don't wander off. Come on back, and we're going to do our final session on the future of technology. And to do that, I've got two terrific uh, guides with us. I've got uh, Ken Smith and Stephen Johnson. Uh, Ken is a senior research scholar at the Stanford Center on Longevity, one of the really wonderful resources that our community has for looking ahead at uh, what's happening with technology. And in particular, he's the director of the center's mobility division. Uh, among other things, Ken has been, I think you've been responsible for the annual student design challenge, and which is going to have its, uh, in, in partnership with uh, Aging 2.0. And uh, the fi finale is next week. You're going to say something about that, I think. 
Okay, good. There'll be a, there'll be a promotion for that. I'm, I'm planning to be there all day. I've been to every one of them. Uh, it's a really neat, neat event. Uh, before he joined the, the Center on Longevity, uh, Ken had 20 years of management and engineering experience in computing, aerospace, and solar energy. He worked at Intel and a number of other important country companies. Ken holds a BS in mechanical engineering from University of Illinois and a master's degree from the University of Washington. So our other panelists, whom you've already met if you were in the previous session here, is Stephen Johnston. Um, he's the founder and director, I guess, we, are you? CEO of Aging 2.0. And uh, 2.0 is an amazing organization. I think I went to the very first meeting they had in San Francisco. It was about 25 people, a pitcher of beer and a bag of popcorn. And uh, we just talked about the, oh, the, okay, it was uh, soft drinks and popcorn, I think. But it was, it was very exciting because he started bringing together people and so there was a kind of energy from the very beginning. And they've really done a marvelous service, I think, for this whole field to kind of accelerate it. Uh, he also serves on the board of another organization I'm very, uh, that I admire greatly, and that's an organization called OATS, Older Adult Technology Services in New York City, and they're the people who created Senior Planet, which is a kind of a model and an inspiration for what we're trying to do with the Generations Lab. Uh, he holds a BS, uh, I'm sorry, an, he has an MA in Economics from Cambridge University, not bad, and an MBA from some place called Harvard Business School whatever that is, uh, where he was a Fulbright scholar and he now lives in San Francisco. So we're going to talk for the next few minutes about the future of technology. And uh, I'm going to start out and give a kind of a framework and then we'll hear from them as get sort of closer to how this moves into dealing with the uh, challenges of aging. So I want to start out with, uh, with Amara's Law. This is uh, something that was uh, first uh, expressed by Roy Amara, who was longtime president of the Institute for the Future, where I worked. And what Roy said is that we tend to overestimate the impact of technology in the short run, but we underestimate its impact in the long run. So we think something is going to be coming, and it's going to just be amazing. It'll be here tomorrow, and then it's not here tomorrow. And then we say, ah, it's not coming at all. And we forget about it, and then eventually it has a really big impact. So I think that's just something that's kind of good to keep in mind as, as we think about how technology arrives. So what I want to share with you is the result of, a, of some work, and there's a lot of text here, but this is a project that was done by a colleague of mine at Institute for the Future, a guy named Mike Liebhold, who also has a, a long uh, experience with technology at places like Apple and at Intel and other places. And what Mike has believes is that we're in the age of what he calls combinatorial innovation. What he means by that is that all of the foundation, or many of the foundational technologies that we need to advance already exist, that we don't really need a whole lot of breakthroughs in order to get to the next stage. There will be breakthroughs, but there is so much here today that just simply understanding that the technology pieces that are available today will give us a, a, a good idea of what might be coming. So let's start with the foundational technologies. But first of all, just, just to step back for a second, the thing that really underlies, why, why do we keep coming back to technology? And what is it about technology? And we're thinking about the future. It really all comes back to Moore's Law. That really is the thing that powers all of this. How many people here are familiar with Moore's Law? Well, about half of you. So let me just say, so Moore is Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel. And in 1965, he made the observation that the number of transistors per square inch on an integrated circuit was doubling every year. So it's sort of a very specific thing. And he also said he believed that this would continue for the foreseeable future, which in fact it has done. And if you do the math, you know, you start with little numbers if you go with two and four and eight and 16 and 32, but you keep multiplying every year by two, you get to some very, very big numbers very quickly. And um, what, what, what that 
results in is exponential change. And it's, I think as human beings, we're just not really designed to think exponentially. We can think inc about incremental change. You know, a gallon of gas is $3 this, uh, this year, it'll be $3.20 next year, $3.50 the year after that. Uh, even our house prices still don't go up exponentially. They may go up a lot, but it's still an incremental process. But exponential change is different. Now, I just want to illustrate it, and this is not exactly Moore's Law, but it's very close to it. And it has to do with digital storage. And so let me just go through a little, just to give you a sense of the, how scales change. So here we are in 1965. This is something called the RAMAC 350. This was the very first hard disk storage system for a personal, for, for a computer. It was part of a very large computer system. Uh, it weighed one ton. Uh, as you could see, it had to be lifted by a forklift and put into a cargo bay. It had a total storage capacity. Oh, it used uh, uh, 124 inch disks. So 24 inch disk, that's like two feet, and there were 100 of them and it had a storage capacity of five megabytes. Well, if you've got a cell phone or any kind of inexpensive camera, every time you take a picture, it's roughly five megabytes. So th that was the total storage capacity of this thing. It turned out the IBM engineer said, uh, you know, we could make one that had a storage capacity of 10 megabytes, but the today, and, and buy it for $15.30, if you're an Amazon Prime member, shipping is free. Uh, and the cost of that is 0 0.0003 cents per megabyte. And so you're talking about, over that course of time, several million times difference in terms of storage capacity, you know, incredibly smaller in terms of scale. And I tried to do, I couldn't even get my calculator to do the math on how many times greater that was in terms of the cost per megabyte. But essentially, you, we're almost to the point where storage is free at, you know, at 0 0.0003 cents per megabyte. So that's, that, as I say, this is an example of, of storage, but it, 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 it's, I think, a good physical demonstration of what exponential change looks like. So let me just run quickly through some of the technologies that are reaching maturity or a stage now where they are components that can be integrated. And in fact, in some of the presentations we've heard today, if you heard about power and clothing, or some of the others, the robots that we just saw, a lot of these technologies are integrated. So one of them is sensors. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of sensors. There are optical sensors. There are physical sensors for things like computer meant a screen and a keyboard. Now you can just simply talk to a machine which kind of understands what you're, you're saying and will do things. And ultimately, you know, may, may end up with this kind of an image you know, Luke talking to C-3PO as, as if that were another, another person. Um, another fundamental technology, machine learning. Uh, it's a type of artificial intelligence that provides computers, this is really interesting, the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So you give it uh, certain instructions and you give it information and the computer itself is able to do the learning. Focuses on the development of progress, programs that change when exposed to new data. So the machines have the ability to kind of evolve and get smarter. Another subset of artificial intelligence is expert systems. Uh, the, these are software systems that facilitate problem solving by drawing inferences from knowledge developed from human experiences. They can simulate human uh, knowledge and automate systems in ways that can equal or outperform even the sharpest human minds in the field. And we're going to see these increasingly augment and times maybe even replace human decision making in fields like investing, medical diagnosis, that can benefit from access to large scale data systems. Uh, another one, pervasive broadband access. Uh, this morning, uh, uh, Larry Maggot talked about how broadband was one of the technologies that changed his life because it was instant and it was so fast. Well, you know, this is a map of uh, Verizon's coverage. It now covers about 90% of the uh, U.S. population. You know, the only areas that are white are basically places where very few, if any, people live. 
But uh, this is uh, this is a little hard to see. But Elon Musk, who has a company called SpaceX, this is the Tesla guy, has a new company, and he's just applied to the Federal Communications Commission to launch a series of over something like 4,000 small satellites in low Earth orbit that would essentially provide pervasive broadband access over the entire world. So the idea that you'd have to erect in antennas one by one in different places, you could just sort of leapfrog that by simply covering the entire world with broadband access. And the other thing that's coming soon is what is known as 5G, which is the next generation of um, uh, wireless service. We are now using 4G, and that's the thing that lets us do uh, web browsing on a, on a smartphone. But the next version, which will come in about 2020, essentially what they call uh, perceived infinite bandwidth, that essentially you'll have as much bandwidth as you need. So the Internet of Things, we've talked a little bit about that, and that's the idea, instead of just having machines or people online, all kinds of devices, millions, billions, possibly even trillions of individual devices, anything that can be turned on or off or that has a sensor will have its own uh, web address on the Internet, and it will vastly expand the, the ability to control all kinds of systems from homes, from factories, uh, from moving vehicles. Uh, cloud computing, somebody mentioned cloud computing. Was that you? Um, I know it came up at some point, or I guess Larry was talking about it early this morning. Essentially the idea that, you know, you not only have access to the computing in your device, but, you know, un sort of uh, computing power all over the place in these large data centers. Uh, Amazon uh, started a, a cloud computing business, something called Amazon Web Services, AWS. It is now, I think it's a $12 billion business for Amazon. It's, uh, it's their second largest business. And one of the things that this implies, that I think is really interesting, is essentially it gives us access to supercomputing on demand. Uh, if you think about something like Google Maps, um, you know, you just take your phone, you put it in your car, and not only will it show you the route from where you are to where you want to go, but it also knows what all the traffic conditions are everywhere in that map and computes at every time what your optimal route is. So I used to use it just when I was going to some place I didn't know how to get to. Now anytime I go out the door, if it isn't just down to my local grocery store, um, I, will, I will use Google Maps. Not only will it give me the optimal route, it'll tell me within a minute the time that I'll arrive. So even if I'm sitting in a traffic jam, it's very comforting because it's telling me, you know, you'll get there in 10 minutes. You'll be there. This will this will get by. So you know, and and other applications, who knows? But essentially, unlimited computing is available in our pockets. Uh, a concept that I think I, I really like. This is a concept of a man named David Rose. Enchanted objects, where technology is infusing ordinary things with a little bit of magic to create more satisfying interactions and evoke an emotional response. So we'll have, have you know, here's an umbrella that'll tell you, take me today because it's going to rain. Uh, objects and interfaces are going to be able to re respond almost intuitively, adapt to our movements, our words, facial expressions, and so forth. We've also talked a lot about autonomous vehicles. I mean, if you live around here and drive around here, I mean, it's no big deal to see these things on the road. I mean, I've been seeing them for years. Uh, you know, I'll be driving down, I don't know, El Camino Real, and there'll be a Google self-driving car, and, you know, uh, they behave perfectly fine. I've not had any problems with them. In fact, I once talked to somebody who, whose job it was to take these out, and I said, you know, do you keep your hands on the wheel? And he said, well, near it. And then I said, are you ever scared? And he says, yes, he says, by other drivers. So those, those things have come along very, very rapidly. So, you know, and then finally, robotics. Uh, we just saw one of those here. Um, you know, whether they're going to, you know, there, there's been a whole lot of sort of fantasies. This was the movie Robot and Frank, about a robot companion for uh, Frank Langella. Uh, but, but robots are, are coming uh, very quickly as well. Um, and then, finally, let me just end up, I hope you'll be able to see this. This is one of my favorite visions of the future. This was a 
short video that was done as a kind of vision of the future by Apple Computer. It was done for John Scully for an, an, a conference in 1987 called The Knowledge Navigator. And if you haven't seen it, I, I, it's on YouTube. I, I urge you to go on YouTube and see the whole thing. We're just going to look at about a minute of it. And uh, it, was, it was done in 1987, 30 years ago. Um, but I think it's still a very compelling vision of the way in which a, com uh, a human being might interact with a computer. And hopefully this will run. Or it won't. It is, it's, ah, it's not going to run. No, it's not going to run. Well, I recommend that you, and we're short on time, so we're going to let it go. Go on, to, go on to YouTube, Google Knowledge Navigator, and it's a wonderful, it's a story about a professor who's preparing for a lecture, and he's, but he's got this little assistant with him that's in the computer, and they really work together in, in a wonderful way. Uh, and it's, it's really, really nice. So I'm going to stop at this point, and now I want to turn it over to Ken, who, as I say, is at Stanford and has another view, a different, very different lens, but an equally compelling one of where technology will be going. Thank you, Richard. That was actually a perfect lead into what I, I was going to talk about here today. Um, that Knowledge Navigator, I remember that video, and actually um, one of the precursors to that was out of uh, Xerox Park down the road here. I don't know if any of you have ever heard the name of Mark Weiser, um, but Mark was probably, he's one of the really underappreciated guys from the Valley that had a vision of the future back in the mid-80s um, that looks an awful like, lot like what we do now. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. I find myself in the unusual situation of being the academic guy that's going to try to say this is more real. You know, and usually in these future discussions, the academics are always talking about 35 years out. And I think what I wanted to try to impress today was that we are entering, if you're a technologist or somebody who appreciates it, an extraordinarily exciting time. Um, and it's because we've been talking about a lot of these visions for a long time. I mean, Captain Kirk said computer on back in the... Uh, in the 70s, and um, you know, famously Peter Thiel, who um, many of you may have heard of around here, uh, has said that you know we were promised jetpacks and given 140 characters, and we've always had this promise of of technology, but it hasn't quite ever been the thing that we thought it was going to be in our everyday life. And I think what I want to talk about today is why I think that we are at this precipice here, where a lot of these things that we have been chatting about and saying are 20 years out for the last 35 years. Um, are actually really here now. And so I, I wanted to start just by talking about how our perception of time sometimes gets a little bit warped when we, we don't realize how quickly things do in fact change. Because we're good at knowing what happened last year, we're maybe good at looking back 40 years, but in that midterm, it's hard to really judge how things shift. So these are some things that, that 15 years ago were state-of-the-art technology. Um, so the phone up on the left, the Nokia, I had one of those actually, um, was the, the popular phone. Um, we thought that um, intelligent agents on computers looked like the Microsoft Clippy, um, which I don't know if any of you, did any of you ever experienced Clippy? Usually what was the first question? How do I shut it off? Yep. <laughs> um, also 15 years ago, um, Apple launched the first iPod, so it was really kind of one of the first MP3 portable music players that was, that was digital. And then if there's any basketball fans in the, uh, the audience, 15 years ago the NBA Finals were between the LA Lakers and the Philadelphia 76ers. And I don't know if you have basketball fans here now, but they are currently vying for the first pick in the lottery because of the worst teams in basketball. So what I thought I would do is go through just four trends. You could go through more. I think Richard pointed out an awful lot of them. But what I'll try to do is, is talk a little more about where they are in the technology progression and why I think they're really now things that you're, you're actually going to see. And you're actually starting to see them you know, very quickly. So autonomous vehicles, it sounds like, has gotten discussed around here. And I, like Richard said, you know, I think the thing that's really remarkable now is that when I get behind an autonomous car on San Antonio, 
one of my first thoughts is, shoot, this thing's going to go 25 miles an hour, and, and I want to go 35, right? It's just become run-of-the-mill to see that. And when you think about how that will impact um, older people, you know, we, we did a workshop on this with the Stanford Center on Automotive Research a couple of years ago, and driving and losing a driver's license for older people is really a large um, milestone in their life. And, you know, what some psychologists have looked at this, and it's kind of on the same order of magnitude as losing somebody in their extended family. And so when you start to think about just that's gone. I mean, you've talked for years we've been talking about moving older people into senior centers, into the city, because we can't we don't have the transportation. That just leapfrogs that entire technology. And and I think it's gonna just change a lot of things and clearly it's not that far away. The other thing that I wanted to talk about from autonomous vehicles is not it's not what you normally think of as autonomous vehicles, but it's drones. Um, and I was at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas earlier this year, and if there was one technology that was the technology, it was drones. They were everywhere. And people are talking about delivery and talking about all these things, but the slide that I like that talks about really what that impact is, is um, one that was done by a, a consulting firm that looked at the cost of delivery and how, you know, if you look on the far right up at the top, it basically says next day delivery runs anywhere from, you know, six to twelve dollars. Amazon Prime here, they're forecasting to be 30 minutes or less for a dollar. And so it, it starts to bring up these questions of, well, is it, worth to go, is it worth it to go out to Starbucks? You know, or do I just order it in? Um, there, there's kind of a really interesting natural experiment that's going on right now in Cairo, um, Egypt. Because of the economy, costs have dropped so far that you can get almost anything delivered, in this case by hand, to your house. And it's this whole new paradigm where people just like aren't even going, some people aren't even going out of their house because everything just shows up and it doesn't cost any more to have it at your house than it costs to go out. Not, not sure that that's my, my choice, but um, I think it's really going to start changing things. So the second one I wanted to talk about was wearable devices. And this is another one of those technologies that's been around a long time, but where we're going now is, is very different. So I would say we are entering phase three of wearable devices, and I'm kind of focusing here on activity measurement and healthcare. But phase one was really the pedometer, right? And we all got our, should you do 10,000 steps a day? Which somebody asked me a couple weeks ago where that came from, and it turns out it was a Japanese company that liked the idea of 10,000, and it sounded like a great number, and it was easy to market. So we do a lot of activity research, and I would say do as many steps as you can. There's not anything magic about the 10,000, particularly for older individuals. But that was kind of the state of the art, you know, maybe 10 years ago. Um, phase two, I think, was probably best exemplified by Fitbit, which is how much did you move today? So these are devices that are built around accelerometers that can tell where you moved and how much and kind of do an energy expenditure calculation. Um, and that's been what you've seen just this huge proliferation of. Um, there's a, a site called Vanderco on the web that catalogs all of these wearable devices. And I think last time I looked, they had something like 435 different devices that all are in some sense versions of like a Fitbit. It, it's sort of, they may do different clever things with the data, they may give you a different interface, but it was really all about how much you moved. So phase three is getting really interesting because I think the next thing you're seeing with wearables, and they are starting to roll out now, is not measuring what you did and where you moved, it's what's happening inside your body and how are you reacting to it. Um, so, for example, many of the major manufacturers, um, Samsung came out with a new watch, the Apple Watch, you know, will now measure um, real-time heart rate. And so when you're exercising, it's not you have to walk this fast, you can walk up until, you know, your heart gets to a certain level. Um, and that's just going further and further and further. And th so blood pressure is going to be the next thing. Um, Microsoft has done something with arterial wall stiffness, which has some implications. Um, and then the, the next, I think, shoe to fall is going to be um, being able to do sweat analysis, and that's going to give you real-time blood sugar, which is going to be a big deal because now when you look at diet, you can start to look at, you know, when you eat that donut, what does it do to you? Or if you're diabetic, you know, what is your blood sugar? And you can start to tune your own, uh, your own diet, and or is your heart rate remaining stable? And 
you know, all of those things when you start combining it, to talk about the combinatorial stuff, is you combine that with cloud computing and you start to combine that with artificial intelligence and now you start to talk about your wearable measures this, sends it to the cloud, it's analyzed, it knows about you particularly and says, well, you know, you really should do this, this thing. Maybe you should have a carrot. I don't know. Um, but to kind of drive home the reality of some of this is, I'm showing a couple of pictures here. Um, the one on the bottom, it's kind of hard to see, I think, probably in this room. But the one on the bottom is a contact lens that Google has prototyped that actually um, measures the fluid in your eye for blood sugar. And it broadcasts to your cell phone from your eye. And it's in prototype stage. The one above that is um, some work that's been done by John Rogers at Northwestern. Um, and that's actually, it kind of looks like one of those rub-on tattoos that kids use, um, but it's got a fully capable integrated circuit in there that can do measurement of, of things like blood sugar and all those kind of things as well. It's wirelessly powered through radio waves. Um, and so you can actually wear one of these things. And it's close enough to reality that they've piloted it. I saw pictures of this in neonatal wards where they've put these on babies to do heart rate measurements and to do EEGs and things like that so that they no longer have to have these wires hanging off them for these, these preemie babies. Uh, and if you know anything about getting research done, if you can get through the IRB or the, the safety um, protocols for using something on preemie babies, it's pretty solid. Um, third trend I want to talk about was AI in, in general, and I'm kind of combining a few things here um, because I'm, I'm using artificial intelligence relative to voice interfaces too. Um, and my, so just personally, my wife graduated um, from college in 1986 and went to work for an AI company in New Haven, Connecticut, where they were trying to do natural language processing of bank transactions. Um, so this is now fast forwarding, what, 30 years later, we're finally now starting to see artificial intelligence in very real ways. And it's really being precipitated by something called deep learning. Uh, I don't know if everybody's heard that term. But what it amounts to is we used to kid in computing that if you wanted to set up an AI or an expert system, you would hire three PhD students, give them two years, and you would get one application because they would have to do all of this very specific programming. But these systems now have what's called neural networks in them that are self-learning. So what you need to do is feed it data, and then it decides what the patterns are that become the the, the, the AI. So up on the left side here, some of you may have heard about this, um, the IBM Watson machine, which is based on this, um, actually recently defeated the world champion Go player. And Go is, is a, an Asian, primarily Asian game that's actually supposed to be at least an order of magnitude more complex than chess in terms of its strategy. Um, and it was considered kind of one of the things that computers would never be able to do. And what was very interesting about this is that not only did it defeat him, but it came up with strategies that no one had ever seen before in the game on its own. And the, the, um, Lee Sedal, who was the gold champion, actually used to defeat about 70% of his opponents. Afterwards, he, he's defeating about 90 or 95% of his opponents because he's got these strategies that he learned from the computer that no one had used before. Um, you see the, the, uh, the, echo, the Amazon Echo there, and I particularly wanted to just show the fact that we now have this voice interface machine sitting in our home and you're buying it at Bed Bath & Beyond. Um, and then some of these other applications, you know, you can pull up uh, you know, on your Apple facial recognition, you can say, I want every picture of my daughter, and it will go in, it will do face recognition, and this is just on a laptop computer, and pull out all the pictures. Um, this one on the bottom left, uh, there's a dermatologist application now that, I guess there are thousands and thousands of types of melanomas, that if you catch them early, I think the, the survival rate is like 96%, if they go very far down the road, it can be less than 15%, um, but the, the system now is better than the, the best doctors in terms of being able to diagnose these. You take a picture of the melanoma, and it then sorts through every sort of melanoma that's ever been seen as compared to your doctor who, who has to try to have seen these things himself or read a medical paper. And for some of these systems, computers are very quickly going past doctors. So the technology gets easier to use. I think your doctors get smarter. And as I think somebody mentioned in, in, during Stephen's presentation, the job market maybe gets a whole lot tougher. Um, there was a piece in the Chicago Tribune, uh, I think it was just yesterday, that was, uh, it was estimated that 38% of, of today's jobs won't be here in 15 years as a result of uh, technology. So there's both sides of the coin. The last one I'll mention is virtual reality. Um, 
it, it's always been kind of one of those cool things that people talked about using for gaming. Um, and so we have this picture of a VR, like the guy on the top there, um, who's off, you know, shooting aliens. But now you're actually seeing real applications being sold for virtual travel. So, for example, people that can't get out, you know, can put that on and experience going to, say, Venice. Um, virtual workouts, there's actually, if I can remember the name of it, there's a company that's actually selling this now uh, where you put your headset on and you get on a bike and now you are riding with all of these other people through the countryside in Tuscany and this is where you're doing your workout. Um, and then on the far right side is actually some work we're just talking about now, it's very early stage. Um, there are a couple of companies that are now doing real-time virtual reality. So I went to a conference um, in February and it was in Orlando and they were demonstrating this technology, this is the Samsung booth, um, and they were doing a operation, it was a healthcare conference, an operation in Greece, and you could put the headset on and you were real time in the operating room and you could look around. And apparently the bandwidth required is if you can get Netflix, you can, you can use this thing. And so when you start to again think about how the applications might be here, you know, we talk about all of these things where we have loneliness or we have isolation, and we've talked about you know things like Facebook maybe doing some good or Skype. The next question becomes, you know, what does a virtual presence do for you? Does it actually start to get you close to that point that you get those same social benefits that you see with face-to-face -face interaction? Uh, and we're actually going to be trying to do some studies on that in the short term. So the idea would be, is it different to call somebody on Christmas morning than to have a 360-degree camera sitting in the room and to put on your headset and to be sitting in the middle of that Christmas morning where you can look around, talk to the person behind you, and you get to actually set the way that the interaction occurs. Now, there's actually there, to, again, to kind of put both sides of it here in play, people said, wow, that would be great. It would make me feel less lonely. There are psychologists who say that might actually make people feel worse because it'll just hammer home the fact that they aren't there. So I think it's important that we actually keep doing the science and the evaluations on these things before necessarily diving in headlong. So that's all I'm going to say about technology. Um, as I said, it's an exciting time. I mean, it's, you know, people will talk about when, if you were, if you were in the Roman Empire, you wanted to live in Rome during the height of the empire. And I feel like as a person who's interested in technology, living where we do right now is, you know, living at the center of the empire. And it's very exciting. Um, now here's my shameless plug slide that I, I told Richard I would use is that we have a uh, design challenge that we run every year at the Center on Longevity that's open to any university in the world. And we, um, we basically put out a call around a particular topic related to longevity and aging. This year it was innovating aging in place. Um, and anybody in the world can enter from a university. And if they make the finals, which is judged by a group of experts, we fly them to Stanford and they present and compete for a $10,000 first prize. So this Thursday, if anybody's looking for something to do over at Stanford, um, we have nine teams coming in from the US, Canada, China, Brazil, and Pakistan. Um, to compete. Uh, we have a keynote by Seth Sternberg, who's the founder of Honor. If you've heard of Honor, they're a, a very forward-looking company that, in, they were here? Okay, well Seth is gonna be, uh, is gonna be the keynote speech. Uh, the, we have nine judges who are gonna pick the winner that day. Um, it's free to attend. Um, you even get a free lunch out of it, so there is a free lunch. Um, and if you'd like to uh, check into that, just go to the Center on Longevity's website at longevity.stanford.edu. You do need to sign up ahead. We are limited in space. The room holds 250, and we generally do uh, sell out every year. So that's a good point, Richard. Thank you. Um, with that, I think we should move on to Stephen. audience is empty or just like a full of robots you know we need to, as you say there's people people are part of this whole thing right uh, this is so interesting I'm so happy to be here thanks um, thanks Richard for putting uh, this on um, we uh, at aging 2.0 some of you who might have been in the, the previous session I won't go into too much detail but uh, we spend a lot of time looking around the world for the most interesting innovations and technologies to improve the lives of older people and I think Richard has done a fantastic job here you know your homegrown expert uh, he's really some, somebody who's been a friend of Aging 2.0 for the for the years since we got started and he's really brought together the people in the room 
um, some of the really interesting technologies. So I just sort of commend you and thank you for this opportunity. I think this is a, it's a fascinating conversation. And I'm going to just talk about a couple of things. You may not be able to see too much on the slide. It's meant to be blurry, by the way, this slide, uh, just in case it's unclear. Um, the two things, you know, I don't know about you, but my head is spinning uh, after those last two presentations. We have an exponential uh, technological revolution, and as Ken says, you know, this is a time. This is sort of the uh, time in history where um, uh, we're seeing this dramatic leaps forward and big, big questions for society. And so I think my uh, piece is, is, is not to kind of get you even more excited about technology, but sort of bring it back a bit. And I think the, as I was hearing both of the presentations, the thing that occurred to me is actually um, this is really, um, the, the, the people who are going to be most important in deciding what the society looks like and how this all works is you in the room. I think the technology folks are doing a great job of coming up with their ideas, coming up with new technologies, coming up with big visions, and they're not going to get anywhere unless those products are actually centered around the kinds of things that you need and the kind of conversations that need to be had uh, throughout the lifestyle, life stage of a technology. We need to start off with understanding what people actually want rather than what some technology is available to do. And then we need to have a dialogue, an ongoing discussion with these people and having the technologists and the uh, older adults and the caregivers and the business people all in the same room. And I think that's something that uh, for me is, is quite an exciting uh, opportunity for us to put together uh, an ecosystem. This is just a, is meant to be a, a very difficult slide to read. It's a, it's a snapshot of about 50, 60 companies that we found uh, in the last couple of months in a, a Robert Wood Johnson funded uh, report on the state of global innovation. Um, and you know, the takeaway here is that there are some of these big categories. We put them into uh, mind, mobility, independence, and care, in which we've got people doing really interesting work, um, whether it's sensor-based or robots or um, connecting people from afar. That's, it's almost as a state where we've got more and more technology, but how does it really help people? And June uh, is one of our chief elder officers, our CEOs, uh, so some of you may, uh, may have met her on previous events, but it all comes down to the fact when June was coming into our office saying, hey, I, I heard about you guys, you know, but what are you doing for me? You know, really make it actually real and make it something that I, I wouldn't be involved in this conversation. I need to be part of this. Don't design for me, design with me. And happens that June is really smart, experienced, a product designer and has a lot of expertise. And she got involved with, with Ken's design challenge and was saying, look, you know, I want to go to the store or the, uh, the ferry building on a Friday morning every, you know, or a Saturday morning, and I want to buy these awesome heirloom tomatoes, but I've got to then come back up the stairs from the, you know, as you know, San Francisco is, is not particularly easy to navigate around. And somebody helped me design an awesome product that can actually help me do shopping. And so, uh, one of the, um, the, the, the sets of student teams said this is a great challenge to solve and they created this wonderful uh, cart that was um, then really designed to do the job of getting June's tomatoes back from the ferry building uh, up, those, uh, up those stairs and up those um, uh, the steep hills, but also look cool because June had very uh, stiff requirements that this needed to be a sexy looking machine. She didn't want any... You know, the, the walker that has had those tennis balls on has been, I think it was like 60 years ago that they first come. Have we not been able to do any better than the walker? This is a super sexy walker. And June was super happy to win with her team one last year's prize at the Stanford Design Challenge, which is fantastic. And she was happy with the walker um, or the, the city cart. And this is the kind of direction that we need to see, which is a conversation between these wild-eyed, awesomely talented technologists and these students and actually the people who need it. And so going forward, we have a problem, which is we still haven't figured out how to make things simple. And this is a metaphor. This was a picture I took last summer when my parents came to visit from little old England and they were 
we hired an Airbnb, and there was one television, and there were eight remotes. And thank, you know, if this had been a smart home of the future that looked after me and had robots coming out of the walls and had pills doing this, and this was just to run the TV. So I didn't even know where to start. Um, the problem here, the, sort of the bigger picture is that we, in the technology world, haven't done a very good job of taking these ideas and actually then scaling them into the market. And I think that's the next edge. That's where we need to work on making it easy so that person who's presented with the uh, city cart doesn't have, just get confused, doesn't know who's going to, um, who should be buying, you know, this could be a, a group of eight city carts and who, which is the best city cart to buy. So uh, we are just, you know, I guess this message is we're super, we, we are super committed, we're excited about technology, we live in Silicon Valley, we breathe this stuff and I think uh, Ken and Richard put together that, the, the most effective presentation I've seen about some of the, the technologies. But we need to kind of shift the conversation away from, a, uh, from these startups and the technology companies from thinking technology for its own sake to thinking about what are those solutions and how do we knit things together. And this means we bring um, different parts of the industry together and to solve these problems. And so I mentioned this in the previous session. So we've just launched something called the Grand Challenges, which is a way of us taking the Aging 2.0 uh, network. We have about 3,000 startups uh, across 50 chapters, about 15,000 people uh, in 20 countries who are all supporting the uh, subscribers of Aging 2.0, but it's getting very busy, it's very noisy. Uh, and so we need to start to kind of shift, I think we have a time to exit, we have a, um, we need to shift this conversation. And so this is what I'm sort of opening up the conversation. These are 12 topics that we won't go into, but we are gonna be working over the, the next few, um, few, uh, few months. And then the final slide here, is to say, we are opening a conversation with you all. We are having um, a, a, every part of the journey of, of innovation here, dialogue, develop, deploy, distribute, and scale, needs to have your input. We need to have you telling us what you need. You have your conversations with older people, so between older people and technologists and designers and, and industry. We need to have the providers, folks like Avalida is doing a fantastic job of testing these kinds of technologies, and then uh, scaling them up uh, and finding investors and getting um, customers to really make these things happen. So I'm really excited, but the message here is don't be kind of swayed by the technologies because you are also part of the conversation and there's multiple ways to get involved. Um, as you heard, come along on Thursday, it'll be a fantastic day um, uh, at, the, at the Stanford Design Challenge. We've got ch local chapters here uh, in Palo Alto and in San Francisco. We're looking for older people to be part of those um, sort of elder councils and love to continue the dialogue. Uh, but for now, I just want to say thank you for you for being here and for Richard for organizing. Thank you. So it, it, it's, it's almost time to say goodbye. One final request, and that is you will be getting an email in the next day or two with a link to an online survey. And you know, normally at these conferences, we we hand out paper surveys, and we won't let you leave until you filled it out. Well, we're going to trust you. And I say, oh, okay, can we do that? And they say, yes, yes. You know, these are Abenitas people; they'll do it. So I'm really counting on you. We really, really want the feedback from you. You've been here for the day. You've given us a day of your time. And we want to do this again, but we want to make it better next time. So please, when you get that link, take a few minutes, fill out the survey, and give us some feedback about what you liked, what didn't like so much, and that'll be helpful. And again, let's just give one more big round of applause to everybody who contributed.